Well, we want to extend a warm welcome to you to this third segment, and it just happens to be the worship hour. And so we ask that the Lord will be with us, but we thank you for joining us for this symposium entitled, what is it? The God We Worship. Did you know that on Sabbath, the shoe bread was cooked? Mm -hmm. What happens when bread is cooked? Oh, it smells good, doesn't it? The aroma just fills the room. It fills the house. And when the aroma fills the house, what happens to our appetite? It opens up, and in fact, we yearn to eat some of that bread. So, the bread is being served. And I pray that the appetite is really growing in you. It certainly is with me. We truly have been blessed thus far with the heavenly bread. Let us pray as we begin. <clears throat> Lord of heaven, oh, I ask myself the question, who are we that we should try to wrap our arms around the God we worship? The infinite, the almighty, oh Lord, the limitless, and here we are in significance of flesh, Sinful, limited, infirmed people, sinners that we are. And Lord, we are searching the depths and the heights and the breadth of who you are. And Lord, we humble ourselves to say that we are going to approach you boldly just now. To ask for wisdom from on high, for knowledge and understanding. And Lord, we know that we're dealing with spiritual things, and these spiritual things can only be discerned spiritually. And so we pray that your Holy Spirit will anoint the lips of your servant, and will anoint our hearts and our ears, Father, to be obedient to that which you have revealed of yourself. So we thank you for joining us and for being ever present in our lives. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Frank M. Hosel, Ph.D., is an Associate Director of the Biblical Research Institute at the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists in Silver Spring, Maryland. He is the author of the recent book, Longing for God, a Prayer and Bible Journal, published by Pacific Press in 2017. This powerful prayer journal is filled with spiritual insights as well as practical ideas for making your prayer life more fulfilling and drawing you closer to God. Born in southern Germany, he received his theological training in Germany, England, and the United States. He earned a Ph.D. in systematic theology from Andrews University in 1994. His dissertation dealt with the use of scriptures in theology. He is an ordained pastor and is a member of several academic societies. He has published numerous journal articles and has been published widely in scholarly books, along with Bible dictionaries and encyclopedias. Please welcome Dr. Frank Hazel as he presents The Amazing Work of the Holy Spirit. If you're an Adventist and you're into theology and graduate study, the Hazel family are legends. His uncle, Gerhard Hazel, is just a legend of theology in the Adventist church. I've had quite a few classes uh, by him. Uh, Gerhardt's son, Michael, is an archaeologist at Southern Adventist University. And then, of course, Dr. Frank Hazel uh, is a cousin of Michael, and he's at the Biblical Research Institute. I almost teared up when he told me that his wife passed away nine years ago. I uh, can't imagine going through that. Uh, he loves his son, who is an architect in the L.A. area. I hope you get a bit of time afterwards maybe to, to go and see him. He tells me that he has not climbed Mount Whitney 10 times or, or even once, but he has climbed mountains in Austria, and he sure loves uh, bike riding as well. Thank you so much for coming. I appreciate all your quick responses via emails and all the arrangements. You have truly been a joy to work with. May God bless. Thank you. Good morning. 
Happy Sabbath. Shabbat Shalom. You know, I have to confess, I, I appreciate the welcome here, and, but I don't quite feel comfortable with all these long titles and all that, especially when we are in church. Because, to be honest, in church, it doesn't count whether you have a PhD or an MD or any academic title. In the church, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? So just call me Frank or Brother Hazel. <laughs> and that's, that's the best when we are together in the fellowship here in the church. Uh, isn't it nice, isn't it wonderful to know that on this Sabbath morning, we are not just worshiping God here in, the, in this church here in Central California, but that there are thousands and thousands and tens of thousands and millions of other Christian believers who worship God on his holy Sabbath day. Amen. Not just in North America, in inter-America, in South America, in Africa, in Europe, in Asia, in the South Pacific, literally around the globe. And I think it's a sign of encouragement to know that we are not the only ones, but that there are others who love the same God that we worship and who worship God on the day that is special to him. So I bring greetings to you, also from the General Conference. I just recently transitioned from Austria to the General Conference and I bring greetings to you from the General Conference where I work in the Biblical Research Institute there. I don't have any PowerPoint presentations, but I have a power word. <laughs> and since I don't have any PowerPoints, I hope I have your undivided attention and will delve into something that I hope will help us to understand and appreciate the Holy Spirit and his word even better. The story is told of a young, young pastor, an intern. He was assigned to preach at a very tiny, small country church, way, way out in the countryside. He'd never been there before. He didn't know anybody there. Nobody knew him. And so he was traveling out to preach in that little church. And when he arrived, he noticed no cars in the parking lot. Nobody here. He noticed there were no deacons to greet him. There were no children. There were no women. There were nobody. So he opened the door to the church, and the church was literally empty, except for one old man who sat in the front row. So this young pastor was a little irritated. He says, well, well, now, what is this? I'm supposed to preach here. I have traveled this long way. I've come to serve, and now nobody is here. Should I even preach? What should I do? So he mustered all his courage and went up front to this old man, and he said to him, excuse me, sir, he said, I'm the preacher. I'm supposed to preach today. I see that the church is empty. Um, what shall I do? And the old man just looked at him with a gracious smile and said, you know, I ain't know much about theology, but this I know. If I'm a farmer and I come to my farm and go to the staple and see that all the horses have run away except for one, I still would give him something to eat. <laughs> now that is good advice. So that was encouraging to the young man and he just entered the pulpit and he preached his soul out and he, he preached everything he had learned in seminary and he was just so happy to deliver and at the end, he stood at the door to greet that one person who had listened to him. And of course, he wanted to know how, how his sermon was uh, appreciated. 
So he greeted the man and he, he said to him, well, well now, tell me, uh, how did you like my sermon? How was it? And the old man just graciously looked at the young man, the young preacher, and he says, you know, I ain't know much about theology, but this I know. If I were to come to my farm and go to the stable and see that all the horses have run away except for one, I would still give him something to eat, but I wouldn't give him everything to eat at once. <laughs> So may that be um, an introduction to what we are hearing now in the sermon. When we talk about God and when we talk about the Holy Spirit, there is so much to learn. There is so much uh, that we can study together. And I would like to, to deal with you and, and, and dive into Scripture to understand a little bit better about the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit. But what I will share with you is not everything there is, okay? There is much more to, to be told, and I will not burden you with everything in just a few couple minutes. Often the Holy Spirit is mentioned in connection with the question of the Trinity. But the work of the Holy Spirit is much wider encompasses much more than just his relation to the Trinity. Now, the challenge we face when we deal with the Holy Spirit and with that question is that Scripture itself, the Bible, does not really present the Holy Spirit in any methodical or structured way, in any systematic manner. And perhaps, perhaps this has to do with a peculiar characteristic of the Holy Spirit, namely what I would call his background position. And that is really my first point that I would like to discuss with you. It is interesting that in the Bible, you will find that the Holy Spirit does never seek, does never desire to be the center of the attention. Instead, the Holy Spirit desires to give Jesus Christ all the honor and all the glory and place what has been called a background position in the Trinity. Now, let me pause here for a second because I just want to do that theoretically. I would like to, to have us learn something from this. When we look at this characteristic of the Holy Spirit, I think we can learn something important for us. Aren't we all, as human beings, often tempted to play center role wherever we are? Aren't we all, all too often, not willing to play second fiddle, so to speak? I think we can learn a lot here from the Holy Spirit and how he deals with important spiritual things. See, it is a fact of God's marvelous plan of salvation that Jesus became incarnated. Jesus became human. It was Jesus who became human, not the Holy Spirit. Now, it is interesting the Holy Spirit did not get envious because of that fact. The Holy Spirit did not feel overlooked. The Holy Spirit did not feel that he was treated unjustly and he had to show uh, what he really can do and what he is all about. With his incarnation, Jesus Christ, Jesus became uniquely visible to human beings. It was Jesus who gained, through his incarnation, a distinct place of great prominence, whereas the Holy Spirit played a different role in our redemption. 
more in the background, if you please. And this background position might also be one reason why in the Bible we find the Holy Spirit is rather elusive, is enveloped in a kind of mystery. To say that the Holy Spirit has something mysterious about him, something that cannot be explained easily, does not mean that we cannot say anything about the Spirit. We do say things that are important and we can say things that are true. And some of these things will point out. But when we say this, we express thereby, we acknowledge that there is far, far, far more about the Holy Spirit and about God than we as human beings can really know and understand. And we acknowledge that with the Holy Spirit and the triune Godhead, there is something greater at work than human beings could have invented. No human being, nobody, would have ever, ever come up with an idea of a trinity. There is no human equivalent to that. It, is, it must be something that God reveals to us. So there is so much more about God that we can imagine and there is so much more that we can learn about God that we will never ever come to an end, <clears throat> even in eternity. And you know, eternity is, uh, is a very long time, especially towards the end. <laughs> Continues on and on and on, you know. Even in eternity, we will never come to a point where we've got it all. There will always be new things to be, to be learned. That is one of the reasons why eternity will never be boring. Don't think that. It will be exciting. You will find out things that you've never understood before. And now you see it in a new light. So, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, when we talk about the Godhead, we talk about a mystery. And this mystery stems from God's transcendence. Transcendence means that God is not from this world. He is otherworldly. He is greater and beyond our world. And this, uh, this fact is intensified by the fact that we are sinful beings and we don't understand everything. We are not all knowing. Now, the role of the Holy Spirit is to promote and mediate the presence and the lordship of Jesus Christ through his presence in our lives. Someone has put it this way and I like it, so I read that to you. The Spirit's message, we can say, is never look at me, listen to me, come to me, get to know me. That's not the message of the Spirit. The Spirit always says, look at him, at Jesus, and see him, Jesus. See his glory, Jesus' glory. Get to know him, Jesus. Hear his words, Jesus' words. Go to him, to Jesus, and have life. Get to know him, Jesus, and taste his joy and peace. See, in our world of, in our sinful world of egocentricity, of self-promotion, the beauty, the beauty of the Holy Spirit lies not in self-display, but in divine selflessness. And for this reason, for this reason, I think we believers are called Christians and not Pneumians, followers of the Spirit. Thus, the Holy Spirit teaches us Humility. He teaches us humility in giving glory to God the Father through Jesus Christ, his Son. Allow me to make another practical application here to all of us, to us teachers, to the Sabbath school teachers, to the pastors, to the people who serve in 
responsible administrative roles. No matter where we are, we, we might be just normal church members. Humility. Perhaps humility is one of the most important presuppositions in our knowledge and in our understanding of God's truth. And I have to tell you, humility is a rare quality even among many theologians and pastors and church members. The story is told of the church father Augustine who told about perhaps one of the greatest teachers of rhetoric in uh, ancient Greece. Rhetoric, you know, is the skill, is the art of speaking. Rhetoric is the art of delivering a message, a sermon. And one of the greatest teachers of rhetoric in the ancient Greek world was a, a, a man by the name of Demosthenes. And Demosthenes once was asked by one of his students, he says, now what is the most important aspect of rhetoric. And Demonstanus said, the most important in rhetoric is, number one, articulation. And what is the second most important thing in rhetoric? He said, articulation. Articulation, that is, how you pronounce the words. And what is the third most important thing in rhetoric? Articulation. Why? See, you, you might have the most brilliant thoughts, but if you mumble it in such a way that nobody can understand, <laughs> there will be no blessing. So the articulation, how you pronounce the words, is the number one and two and third. It's the most important. And then Augustine raised the question, he says, now what is the most important in theology? And he says, the most important in theology is humility. And the second most important, humility. And the third most important, humility. Why? Because in the attitude of humility, is expressed our willingness and our openness to submit our beliefs to a higher authority than ourselves. In humility, the highest and the deepest knowledge of God is gained, namely an awareness that we human beings are dependent upon God to gain true knowledge and that man is not the final measure of everything. See, humble people, humble people value truth over their ego's need to be right. And humble people are aware that truth is not of their own making, but is God-breathed. A humble inquiry is the foundation of all kinds of knowledge and learning. Why? Because humbleness generates a freedom that naturally produces a teachable spirit. And that is the foundation for any knowledge and learning. This makes, by the way, this makes humble people very pleasant people to work with as anybody can testify who had to work with proud people. It's not so easy. <laughs> so humble people are aware of their limitations, of their knowledge. And therefore, because they know that their knowledge and their understanding is limited, therefore they are capable of expanding their knowledge and understanding of God's word that an arrogant and a proud person are, would never be able to do. So humility teaches us that we are in need of God himself, who, through the Holy Spirit, teaches us about himself in his word, the Bible. 
In the, in the words of Ellen White, I quote her, she said, quote, when man is willing to be instructed as a little child, when he submits wholly to God, he will find the truth in his word. If men would be obedient, they would understand the plan of God's government, end of quote. And this subordination of our human reason, the subordination of our human thinking to the higher authority of God's word is so important, especially when we deal with the nature of God, when we deal with what we call the Trinity, the triune Godhead. Ellen White also said, and I quote her, God desires man to exercise his reasoning powers, yet we are to be aware of deifying reason, making reason to a God which is subject to the infirmity of humanity. When we come to the Bible, reason must acknowledge an authority higher to itself superior to itself and heart and intellect must bow to the great I am. So whoever wants to understand the Holy Spirit and through the Holy Spirit, God's word, the Bible, and even God himself has to allow the scriptures to be the ultimate and authoritative norm for our faith and experience. Now, having said all that as a kind of introduction, let me start now to outline a few things where I think we can learn about the work of the Holy Spirit that is much, much broader than just the Trinity itself. See, when we think about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, it must strike us that we would not know much about Jesus Christ or about spiritual things for that matter without the Holy Spirit. Why? The Bible makes it clear that we human beings in our sinfulness and fallen state are blind and therefore do not accept the things of the Spirit of God. Why? Because they are foolishness to the unregenerated man. So we cannot even understand them because they have to be spiritually discerned, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2.14. So at the start of every talk about the Holy Spirit, we have to confess that we cannot come to Jesus Christ without the Holy Spirit and his work. Neither can we know anything about God on our own thinking and with, with our own reasoning powers. Instead, we are dependent on the enlightening of our understanding through the Holy Spirit to know God and his will for us. There are several biblical passages that point this fact out to us, uh, point out the tasks of the Holy Spirit, that it is to put Jesus Christ into central focus, lifting up the Son of God and what he has done for us. So the Holy Spirit does not put himself into first place. Instead, he desires that Jesus Christ be honored so that we are led into obedience to Jesus' words in the Bible. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 2 to 3, we read, This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. Thus, the spirit testifies to Jesus just as Jesus said he would do. Uh, just a little earlier, Dr. Che pointed out to us this wonderful passage in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 26, where Jesus says, Jesus says, when the helper comes, 
whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. That is the task of the Holy Spirit. He will testify about me. Thereby the Holy Spirit is obedient to Jesus' word. He follows what Jesus has said he will do. Just as Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness and into his ministry. What Jesus accomplished for our salvation on the cross the Holy Spirit applies to our lives through the living ministry of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary. But brothers and sisters, there is more to the Holy Spirit, theologically speaking. The Holy Spirit plays also a crucial role in our knowledge of God. The Apostle Paul states that it is the Holy Spirit who searches even the depth of God. We read that in 1 Corinthians. He knows God as no other created being does. He not only has unique access to God, he is God himself, a member of the only triune God himself. And for that reason, the Holy Spirit is uniquely fitted to reveal God and his will to us in a trustworthy and in an authoritative manner. God the Holy Spirit reveals divine things to us human beings who are created in the image of God so that he can instruct us in the ways of God and in the ways of Christ. But there is more about the Holy Spirit than that. The special revelation of God, the special revelation of God's will that results in the Bible, in the Holy Scriptures, through the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit is the work of the Holy Spirit. The Bible would not exist without the Holy Spirit. In 2 Timothy chapter 3.16, we read that what the biblical writers wrote was God breathed, was the Spirit of God who brought it forth. It was not something that they thought up in their minds. In 2 Peter we read that no prophetic word is brought forth by human invention. So the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth who brings God's word to reliable remembrance. God the Spirit is the source of God's divine revelation. And that reva uh, divine revelation is faithfully recorded in the written word of God, the Holy Scriptures. So the Holy Spirit moved biblical writers in such a way that what they wrote in their own words was nevertheless God's word and carried divine authority. You just read what the Apostle Paul writes to the, to the, to the believers in Thessalonians. He says, we praise you. You have not accepted the word of our preaching as a human word, but as that which it is in verity, God's word. So it has divine authority. Now think. Just think for a moment. Even though it is the work of the Holy Spirit to inspire biblical writers, to inspire the Bible, God's word, The result, this book, is not a book that is primarily about the Holy Spirit, but is a book that points us primarily to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Isn't that amazing? But there is more to the Holy Spirit than that. To have the revealed and the inspired word of God, brothers and sisters, to have the word of God is not enough. You might have the word of God. It doesn't help you a bit. The word of God also needs to be embraced and wants to be obeyed, right? 
not all who hear the word of God and not all who have the word of God follow its message. To lovingly embrace the scriptural word of God is also a work of the Holy Spirit. Revelation, inspiration, proper understanding of the word and obedience to the word all come from the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no appreciation of the divine message. There is absolutely no desire in us to obey it. There is no faith, hope, and no love in response. We might read the scriptural words, we might understand the linguistic meaning of the words, but we will not have a desire to follow them and obey them. So the Holy Spirit enables us not only to understand what he has inspired, but the Holy Spirit awakens in us a desire to be obedient to what he has given us in the word of God. Thus, the Holy Spirit and his work is not just with scripture in the distant past, thousands of years ago, when the biblical writers wrote what we have now in the Bible. He did not end his work in the distant past. He continues to speak to people today through the Bible, making the written word of God come alive as he helps us to understand the significance and the relevance of the biblical text for our lives today. So true understanding will always lead to a willing and loving obedience to the written word of God. And, and let me make this plain and clear. God will not lead us, even through his spirit, in any way away from the words of scripture. But he has committed himself through the Holy Spirit, to the sure word of the Bible. I like the words of Ellen White, and you have read them before. You know them in the introduction to that fabulous book, the fantastic book, The Great Controversy, where she writes, the spirit was not given, she says, nor can it ever be bestowed to supersede the Bible. For the scriptures explicitly state that the word of God is the standard by which all teachings and experience must be tested. End of quote. Ellen White is right on that one. By embracing the scriptural word as trustworthy and true, we are led by the spirit to accept the living word of God, Jesus Christ, as our Savior and Lord. So at the heart of the Spirit's truth is not the Holy Spirit, but is Christ. But there is more to the Holy Spirit than that. And this is actually, this is mind-boggling. See, the Holy Spirit is not only responsible for the Bible that we hold so precious today. The Holy Spirit is also significantly involved in making the word of God visible, tangible, touchable. We could say, make him human. See, the Holy Spirit was instrumental in letting the word become flesh. You just read John chapter one. The Holy Spirit was responsible that Jesus Christ was born on this earth. The word of God in flesh. That the Holy Spirit is responsible in, in a variety of ways of accomplishing that. Number one, the Spirit prepares the way for the Messiah prophetically. As the voice of prophecy is heard in the Old Testament, pointing forward to Jesus Christ and his coming. And in the New Testament, through the prophetic words of Zechariah and Elizabeth and Simeon in the temple, who recognize in the baby Jesus, the Messiah who had come. And second, and perhaps even more important, 
the Holy Spirit is involved in the conception of the Messiah. The conception of the Messiah is spirit-crafted, if you please. It is the Holy Spirit who is responsible for the conception of Jesus Christ in the Virgin Mary. In Luke chapter 1, verse 35, we read, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, Mary, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And the result is not just a supernatural conception that leads to the birth of the Son of God, but the one who is born in that way is called by Luke in Luke 1.35, that holy thing. Now that is an expression that is unique to Jesus Christ. No other human being is called that holy thing. It's Jesus Christ alone. And it signifies that Jesus is indeed the Son of the Holy One. That Jesus is the Son of God. That Jesus is truly divine. Just as he is genuinely human. Jesus, I'd like to say, has uh, a mother like all of us have a human mother. But the father of Jesus is so much different than all of our fathers can be. See, Jesus has God, the Holy Spirit, as his father. But there is more about the Holy Spirit than that. The Holy Spirit not only leads us to Christ, he not only brings forth Jesus Christ, the flesh, or the word of God in flesh, the Holy Spirit is the one who gives us assurance of salvation in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God, Paul says in Romans 8, verse 16. He gives evidence of the work of God in us. And by this we know, John writes, that he abides in us by the Spirit he has given us. And John continues in chapter 4, verse 13, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his own spirit. The spirit gives us assurance of salvation, assurance of our adoption as children of God. And it is a pity that many of us don't have the joy of the assurance of our salvation in Jesus Christ and are not sure whether we are saved or not. The Bible says we can be sure. I cannot give judgment over other people, but I can have the joy of assurance that my sins are forgiven. I'm a son of cross. You're a daughter of, of, of the king. You've been adopted. So <clears throat> the Holy Spirit is the guarantee and the pledge that through faith in Jesus Christ alone, we belong to God and that God will to completion what he has begun in us, as Paul says in Philippians 1 verse 6. But there is more to the Holy Spirit, theologically speaking, than that. The Holy Spirit is not just the guarantee of our assurance of salvation. The Holy Spirit is indispensable in bringing new spiritual life to sinful human existence. The regeneration to new life is made possible through the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, you know the words in John 3, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. In Titus chapter 3, verse 5, Paul writes that we are saved by the washing of regeneration 
and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit's work to awaken in us sinful human beings a heart that is dead. It's like raising the dead bones that Ezekiel describes. And to open blind eyes so that we can see things that we in former ways did, did not even understand and see. And he does this awakening in us by granting us an awareness of our own sinful situation, our sinfulness, and by fostering a conviction that we are indeed in need of a Savior, Jesus Christ. But there is more to the Holy Spirit and his work than that. See, the Holy Spirit, being the third member of the one and only holy God, God is holy, is active, the Spirit is active to change us into the image of Christ. So the Holy Spirit desires us to make us holy as God is holy. For this reason, the Holy Spirit cleanses us from sin. He sanctifies us. And the Apostle Paul writes, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. So the Holy Spirit produces in us a lifelong process of growth in holiness. And he brings forth in us the fruits of the Spirit, a new lifestyle, and new evidence that we belong to him. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. This is the fruit of the Spirit. And he enables us to live victoriously by God's grace. See, sanctification comes to us through the power of the Holy Spirit and is achieved by faith, just as our justification is through faith in God alone. And so the Holy Spirit transforms our character and gives us strength and joy to be obedient to God's will. So let me summarize what I have stated so far. When we talk about the activity of the Holy Spirit, working harmoniously together with God the Father and Jesus Christ, his Son, to accomplish our salvation. See, the Holy Spirit awakens us from our spiritual death. The Holy Spirit leads us to an awareness of our sinfulness and that we are lost. The Holy Spirit kindles in us the desire for change. He leads us to Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit gives us assurance of salvation. The Holy Spirit conforms us to be more like Jesus. The Holy Spirit keeps us faithful in our walk with God. The Holy Spirit enables us to fulfill God's will and mission. The Holy Spirit generates the written word of God as our only safe guide and norm for our Christian life and doctrine. Brothers and sisters, where, where would we be without the Holy Spirit? What could we do without the Holy Spirit? I'm afraid not much. We would be miserable. We would be lost. We could do nothing that would give glory to God and honor his name. But there is still more to the Holy Spirit. We're not at the end. See, the Holy Spirit doesn't end there. He continues. The Holy Spirit empowers believers for mission. And he equips them to do evangelism and outreach. And thus he enables us to do what God has commissioned us to do. To witness Jesus Christ to every nation, tribe, and tongue to the ends of this world, the, the earth. And the Holy Spirit is the one who enables us with his power so that we can fulfill the mission of the church. See, the Holy Spirit 
calls forth people to follow him. By the way, if you hear that subtle and sweet call of the Spirit, if the Holy Spirit works on your heart and mind, and you get the conviction that you should do something, you know, if, if you should ever have the thought that maybe I should go to my brother and my sister or my pastor or whoever it is and ask for forgiveness, be sure that thought never comes from the devil. <laughs> it surely is generated by the Holy Spirit. Amen. You can be sure of that. So if you hear that voice of the Holy Spirit working on your heart and mind, be quick to follow. Don't delay. He longs you to do what he's, he's telling you to do. So he guides, you know, he guides the missionaries. We read that in, in the Acts of the Apostles to specific places to be witnesses for God and to labor for the church. He equips the believers to effectively proclaim the everlasting gospel throughout the whole world. He leads people to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior and to be obedient to the written word of God. And God has devised the gospel message that it should go out into the world through the disciples who have been empowered by the Holy Spirit because they have received the Holy Spirit who has come upon them. Now it is interesting. Even though the Holy Spirit does all that, the heart of the good news is, the heart of the good news that we are to share with others is not first and foremost about the Holy Spirit, but it is first and foremost about Jesus Christ. Amen. See, it is a very, very strange phenomenon that I notice in our Christian world today that charismatic Christians emphasize the Holy Spirit and the receiving of one particular gift of the Holy Spirit, the so-called speaking in tongues, the glossolalia, in such a way that it is given such a prominence that it does not have in the Bible. A worldwide mission can accomplish successfully only if the church is united. And it is here that I believe that the Holy Spirit performs another significant theological task. And that has to do with the unity of the church. See, the Holy Spirit unites us. I'm not sure whether we are aware of that, but we need to, to remember that. The Holy Spirit re unites us in manifold ways. First of all, first of all, the Holy Spirit unites every one of us to Jesus Christ. By driving us to Jesus Christ, our only Savior, he unites us to Christ. Being united with Christ is, if you please, the foundation of all the other blessings of salvation. Justification. Sanctification. Our adoption as children of God. Glorification. Are all received through our being united to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? And this work of the Holy Spirit on the individual level, where he unites each and every one of us to Jesus Christ, this work on the individual level leads to a specific community of faith, the church. Having experienced salvation through faith in Jesus Christ alone, there is a sweet fellowship in the Holy Spirit, in the church, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13. And I think we as a church need to understand that we are a faith community that is called into being by the Spirit. Individual believers are built into a new spiritual house of God in the Spirit, the Paul says. And as followers of Jesus Christ, we should be eager, we should be eager, Paul says, to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3. Uh, do you realize 
that there is virtually no church, no Christian church on earth that does not practice baptism in one form or another. Not all baptisms are the same, not all are by immersion, not all are by faith, where a, an adult believer makes a conscientious decision for Jesus Christ, but there is no Christian church without baptism. And it is interesting that in baptism, by the way, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the one name, not in three names, in one name, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are entering the church of God, the body of Christ. And the very existence of the church of God, of, of the body of Christ, depends on the work of the Holy Spirit. No wonder that the New Testament writers state that the church is the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. And hence, it comes as no surprise that the Holy Spirit actively supports and sustains the various members of the Christian church, the body of Christ, by giving each and every one special spiritual gifts. Different sp gifts given by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. The Holy Spirit has a will. We heard this morning. He is a personality. He's not just a, a power, a force. So he equips us so that we can fulfill the mission that God has given us as a church. And it is the Holy Spirit who produces love in our hearts. And it is love that binds everything together in perfect harmony. And in such loving and spiritual unity, brothers and sisters, Paul says, there is neither male nor female, neither slave nor free, neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither American nor Canadian. There is neither German nor South African, nor Korean, nor any other nation on this earth. There is no other ethnicity or nationality we are all one in Jesus Christ through the work of the Spirit. See, sometimes we credit human beings in leadership positions with the ability to plant and establish and maintain churches. And they do a marvelous job. By the way, don't forget to pray for your leaders. Pray for your union president, for your conference president. Pray for the people in leadership responsibilities. They need it. You know, sometimes as a leader, you can feel quite lonely. And they need the support of your members so that we can work together. But we should never forget that at the most essential level, at the deepest level, the level of the very existence of the church, the church depends on the Holy Spirit. We make seek unity and peace and do everything to avoid strife and disunity among our members. But true and lasting unity will only be accomplished through the Holy Spirit. Ultimately, unity is His work. We are just His humble servants and should not hinder His influence. And by the way, you give room to the Holy Spirit when you confess your sins through his convicting power. And this leads to a fellowship in the spirit uh, that, that is fantastic. So the unity of the church is the work of the spirit through the written word of God, through the Bible, which he has inspired. The Holy Spirit never, ever draws us away from the written word any more than he draws us away from the living word of God Instead, he keeps us in constant and conscious and willing submission to both. And that is the beauty of the Holy Spirit. So any appeal to the Spirit, to the Holy Spirit, without the written word of God, lets the Spirit go wild. And any appeal to the written word of God without the Holy Spirit dries up the word of God and makes it barren. 
We need both. Only the Holy Spirit working in and through the written word of God makes the Bible the living word of God, powerful to transform individual lives, powerful to renew the believer's commitment to God, and powerful to reform the church according to the word of God. The time is up, but there is more to the Holy Spirit. <laughs> there is much more. Allow me, I take the liberty to, to just draw on one more thing, all right? Now, in our increasingly pluralistic society and theologically diverse world, you hear many competing voices who call for our allegiance and our attention. And there is one gift, one gift of the Spirit that is strangely neglected and not present, but I think is more important than ever in our time and age. And that is the gift to discern the spirits. It's one of the spiritual gifts. Some in the church, he has given the ability to discern the spirits. And the Bible warns us that there will be false spirits at work that try to deceive even the believers and aim to destroy what God has established. And the basis and the criteria for discerning the spirits is God's Holy Spirit working in and through and with the written word of God. The Bible teaches that for God's end time remnant church, God has even promised the spirit of prophecy. And this prophetic gift points the believers to the Bible and reveals Satan's strategic plan through which he wants to deceive the world and the church in these last days. And thus, God gives us spiritual guidance and orientation. And I believe that the Seventh-day Adventist church would not be what it is today without an appreciation for the prophetic ministry and guidance of Ellen White. She is a great blessing to our church, and we do well to follow her words and her counsel. While God has given the Holy Spirit and his spiritual gifts to establish unity in the church, it is fascinating to me. See, God has given the spiritual gifts to foster unity in the church, and it is fascinating to me to see that the very Holy Spirit who was given to promote unity has become a divisive factor even amongst ourselves, even amongst Adventism. And I believe that wherever disunity and strife results from our talking about the Holy Spirit and about God, it is not the Holy Spirit who is at work. Amen. Let's be very careful here, but also let's discern the spirits because that is what God has called us to be. Uh, brothers and sisters, my time is up. There is more to the Holy Spirit. You know, I have a whole section here about the Holy Spirit and the ecumenical movement. Fascinating, fascinating things that, uh, that are happening in front of our eyes where we see uh, how Satan is using the Holy Spirit in a counterfeit way to unite the churches, not in the real way, not in the real spirit, but in a charismatic type of spirit and leads them astray. Let me end here by saying that I believe that the spirit of truth will always, always, always lead us to the written word of God, which is truth, as Jesus says in John. The Holy Spirit will be in harmony with the written word of God that he inspired and the Holy Spirit will lead every believer into faithful obedience to all that the Bible teaches. The Holy Spirit will never nullify the Bible. Instead, the Holy Spirit will bring us into harmony with the Bible, the written word of God. And let me end by stating this. It's a personal word. It comes from my heart. It comes from my pastoral experience. I've, I've I've worked as a pastor for many, many years, and I love to work as, as a pastor because it connects you to the people. 
I have found that much more powerful, much more powerful than any supernatural speaking in tongues, than any miraculous gift of the Spirit, any signs of wonders that might appear, is the work of the Holy Spirit when it comes to the conversion of your own heart and mind. See, there is something that is hard, that is tough, that is not easy, and that is to follow the Spirit's leading and to go to my brother and to go to my sister where needed and ask for forgiveness. And sometimes even parents have to go to their children and ask for forgiveness because we are not perfect. And children need to ask forgiveness to their parents. And sometimes we treat our pastors in a way that is not right. And we need to ask for forgiveness. And when the Spirit prompts us to do that, there is something about it that is unsurpassed. If you go to another person and you honestly, not just because you have to, but you honestly go to that person and say, my dear brother, my dear sister, I think I said some things about you that I better should not have said. I stated things in a light that put you in a wrong light. And I want to ask for forgiveness. This is where unity is created. This is where real unity starts. This is where the church comes together again. You cannot command this. You cannot tell people you have to do this. This is something that the Spirit does on your heart and your mind. And if we do that, if we follow the leading of the Spirit, I believe this is much more powerful. It is much more attractive than any miraculous gift that there could be. So this sound biblical theology, a love for the perishing world and a love for our Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, this is what unites us as Seventh-day Adventists around the world. May this be the strength of our walk with God and the joy of our walk with God. And may that mark be visible and recognized by others, I pray. Amen. Let's stand for a word of prayer. Our, our gracious God and Father in heaven, this morning I just want to thank you. I just want to say thank you Thank you, thank you. Thank you for giving us the Holy Spirit. S thank you that, that he points us to Jesus Christ, to our need for a Savior in Jesus Christ. Lord, we confess that we have often resisted the work of your spirit. We've been proud. We have been self-centered. We wanted to be the center of attention. Forgive us. Renew our minds. Renew our hearts. Lead us to you. And let us be men and women in whom you delight, in whom your spirit can work without hindrance, in which unity can grow because your spirit is at work. Lord, this is something we long for and we ask for and we believe you can do because it is your work, it is your church, and we want to serve you. And we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Hi, happy Sabbath. We are coming to you from the Dinuba Seventh-day Adventist Church where we have just heard an engaging symposium piece, The God We Worship, uh, from a keynote presenter, Dr. Frank Hall.
Hazel, who is an associate professor at the Biblical Research Institute of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. Hassel has spoke to us about the amazing work of the Holy Spirit and what that means to us today. One of the key things that you brought out, Dr. Hazel, was the work of the Holy Spirit prior to Jesus coming to earth and prior to his ascension. Many uh, non-Trinitarians believe that Jesus was sort of recreated after the ascension in the form of the Holy Spirit in a, a omnipresent self and while his other portion of himself went back to heaven in a non-omnipresent self. You bringing out the history prior to even Christ's birth sort of destroys that timeline. Y yes, in a, in a sense it does. And I think uh, any person who who proposes any, any such thought um, misses misses out on, on a number of passages in the New Testament that make very clear that the Holy Spirit is not just an emanation of uh, Jesus Christ's spirit, a continuation of the Father's spirit or whatever, but has uh, his own existence, and personality, and um, in fact, the Holy Spirit is, um, is actively um, involved in the birth of Jesus Christ. Because so, as you pointed out, the Holy Spirit came upon Mary for Jesus' conception initially. Yes. So he was involved prior to his life. Yes, yes. And even, even after Jesus' ascension, it is not Jesus' spirit who is, is given. Jesus makes very clear that he will send another comforter, another helper, and the word there it makes clear that it's of the same kind, but a distinct other individual, a distinct so other it's person. So in addition to. Yes, okay. it's it's not he himself in the form of the spirit. It is the Holy Spirit. Any person who who tries to espouse that idea that the Holy Spirit is just the spirit of Christ, effectively denies the existence of the Holy Spirit as an individual entity mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. thereby robs God of his honor and and his glory and and what is due to him so um, I personally I think it's just um, an ingenious attempt to come to grips with something that we humanly speaking do not understand with our our human mind and so we try to to conceptualize something that we rationally uh, mm -hmm. can understand. Mm -hmm. it, but when we do that, we, we make a great mistake. The, the mistake we do is that I, this, I see this as being done by many conservative Adventists, for instance, who mean it well, but who make their own reasoning powers uh, the standard and the norm for what God can be and what he cannot be. So it's a very limited view of it's what It's very God limited. Can Actually, be. they create God into their own image. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's something like Feuerbach said, yeah, the, what we do. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, and it, this might sound strange, but mm -hmm. the procedure is pretty much the same. They do exactly the same as the very liberal theologians do with many other things. They cannot believe in miracles because it doesn't make sense to them rationally. Mm -hmm. So they argue away the miracles and explain them away in a way that they don't have a rational problem with something that is supernatural. Which ultimately diminishes our view of a, of, of a, a God. Exactly, exactly, yes, yes. Also with me here is Dr. Pierre Steenberg, Ministerial Director for Central California Conference. Pierre, I just would like to have you jump right in here. I know sure. you have a lot of questions too. Yeah, I found it very fascinating, uh, this, this circular argument that the Holy Spirit supposedly is just something that came forth from Jesus. Well. How can that be if Jesus came forth from him? So you made the statement that without the Holy Spirit, Jesus couldn't become flesh, couldn't be here. So my question is, without the Holy Spirit being an entity, mm. what is that, where does that leave Christianity? How would Christianity look like if the Holy Spirit was not? As I think Christianity would look quite different, if, if you ask me, and, and that in many respects, because 
it, it doesn't just deal with the issue of, of the Trinity. It wouldn't just change our perspective uh, of the Trinity. It changes the way we relate to God and we relate to the Holy Spirit and we relate to Jesus and to God the Father. If he, if he is not an entity in and of itself, then we treat him as a thing, as a something. Then I want to have more of the Holy Spirit. But if he is a person, if he has signs of a personality, then he wants to have more of me. And he wants to, to take advantage of me. So I think that changes a whole lot on the very practical level of how I uh, experience my Christian life and I practice my Christian life and I, how I relate to, um, to God. Now, <clears throat> as a church, I think we, ha we, we are in a danger of, um, of talking about the Holy Spirit in such a way that he is no longer a reality. And I think we have be become so organized and so well-structured that if, if you would withdraw the Holy Spirit from the church, we would pretty much continue with our activities <laughs> as if nothing had happened. Mm. But there is no power behind yeah. it. Yeah. And there right. is as you th pointed out, the Holy Spirit's job is to dis help us discern spiritual gifts, help us discern spiritual things, help us be convicted of sin. Yes. So without that person in the Godhead, we are just taking up space. It yes, and we are robbing him of his existence, really. We, 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 are, we are cutting down on God himself. <laughs> it, it seems to me that based upon what you've said, we are incapable of being saved without the Holy Spirit. Yes. And now, we have, to, we have to be, well, let, let me qualify that. I mean, it is Jesus Christ who saves us. Right. But it is the Holy Spirit who drives us to Jesus Christ. Right, and the acceptance thereof. And he is the one who, who awakens in us the awareness that we even uh, need Jesus Christ. So without his work, we would never be interested in Jesus Christ. We, we would never, never be convicted. We'd never be convicted. Right. So without his work, yes, uh, we, we, we could not exist as Christians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perhaps a last question from me. Uh, quite a few people get confused between a conscience and the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. What is the difference between my conscience, because some people have no conscience, mm -hmm. and the Holy Spirit? Mm -hmm. Yes, the Holy Spirit can work through your conscience, but our conscience is not entirely shaped by the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit itself. And we have to, to be aware that even our conscious conscience can be distorted or can be abused and needs to be reformed and shaped by the Word of God. So the Holy Spirit, I think, draws our attention to the Bible. He, he, can, he can make us aware of things. He can use the conscience to, to arouse a, um, an awareness of our situation or of something that is not right or wrong. But we have to be careful that our conscience in and of itself is not just the voice of God, mm -hmm. uh, but is shaped by other factors as well. And, and therefore, our conscience needs to be constantly be in contact with the Word of God so that these other factors can be shaped by the Word of God, even in our conscience. Yeah, I really appreciate that clarification because some people want to diminish the Holy Spirit to just become our consciences or Jesus' conscience, and obviously there, there's problems with yes, that. Yes, and I'm glad you point that out because that is why I have repeatedly pointed out that the Holy Spirit... Uh, will never work independently of the of the Bible of, mm -hmm. of the Word of God. Mm -hmm. It will and never it, go against the and, Bible. And never go against uh, yes. the Bible, and and therefore even our conscience needs to be shaped uh -huh. and yes. renewed uh -huh. by the Bible. And if that is not the case, it can go wild, and uh -huh. you can have a bad conscience or a mutilated <laughs> conscience, or you have a conscience over things that that are not relevant to to what the Bible says. Excellent. Well, we need to wind down here, and I notice that your next topic is the personal nature of the Holy Spirit. We want people to watch that with an anti-Trinitarian view. They have to do away with the personal aspects of a Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. I'm excited to hear that next presentation. Stay and watch the next one, please. Thank you. Bye-bye.